smoothly. All right, so uh, today we start um, another part of our course. Uh, we will be considering the possibility of um, function theory uh, be developed out of the structure as of uh, the group SL2R. So let me remind um, what um, typically uh, by analytic functional theory we understand the complex analysis and complex analysis uh, contains several principal results of great importance. So analytic function satisfy Tukashi-Riemann equation. Analytic function uh, shall also uh, satisfy or uh, be recovered using Cauchy integral formula. Uh, there is Cauchy theorem which tells us what um, analytic uh, integral over closed uh, contour is always equal to zero. And there is the expansion into uh, Taylor series of analytic function, which is also very useful when we uh, have uh, studying local properties of analytic functions. If you will look um, in the textbook on uh, complex analysis, you will notice what there are uh, a lot of uh, different textbooks, and they are even built out of uh, different um, assumptions. There are several different approaches to complex analysis. There is so-called Wichstrass approach when you start from the expansion of Taylor C uh, of analytic function into Taylor series and then uh, develop all other results as a consequence of this definition. And there is Cauchy approach to complex analysis when you start from the Cauchy-Riemann equation saying what uh, uh, complex analytic function shall uh, be null solution of Cauchy-Riemann equation and when you de derive all other results. And uh, similarly, uh, there is a possibility uh, to develop also uh, complex analysis out of uh, Cauchy uh, theorem, uh, theorem. So there are different approaches the, based on what, how you define analytic function, you can develop theory accordingly. <clears throat> Uh, let's us discuss uh, is it possible uh, to make a complex analysis or theory similar to complex analysis uh, using hypercomplex units, using dual and double numbers. Uh, really, that idea what we may build something similar to complex analysis uh, is uh, appearing uh, very often, so, uh, so people who uh, learn about existence of dual and double number get that idea what they may take, for example, a real analytic function, so that means a function which has a Taylor expansion, like that, <clears throat> and then simply instead of real variable x, substitute the hypercomplex variable, so and get a similar extension in term of hypercomplex units and uh, in fact uh, there is no reason why uh, for that simple manipulation with series you need to restrict yourself to uh, i squared being complex uh, value minus one not uh, double numbers with square equal to one or dual numbers with square equal to zero so, um, but it's uh, very soon uh, people realize what with, say, double numbers, if we have a unit which squares to one, we may uh, simply uh, introduce idempotence here, uh, this is E plus and E minus, which belong to the light cone, as we discussed on many occasions, this is zero divisors. And properties uh, of uh, this uh, zero divisors, what where product is equal to zero, but each of them behave like a projection square of this um, patent is equal to that uh, uh, unit E plus or minus itself. When it means when we have a power, so binomial formula uh, for such uh, double numbers greatly simplified because we may express 
that, expre uh, that uh, binomial in term of idempotence E plus E minus, and then uh, using the orthogonality, what were a product equal to zero, that simply reduce to the corresponding powers of a difference x minus y and powers of some x plus y. That means what uh, if we will apply the analytic extension in term of series, such analytic function will be nothing else <coughs> but uh, following expression in term of idempotence. This is rather simple. So for any real function, we may simply build such an expression and that will be a Taylor expansion, uh, corresponding Taylor expansion in term of double numbers. If you will notice, it's not completely useless. That is, in fact, produce the fundamental solution of the wave equation on the line. Uh, and it's um, not uh, surprising if you will come back to the first slide of our course in geometrical part, where we discuss factorization of uh, Laplacian and wave equation using hypercomplex unit J. That means what, in, uh, like uh, the uh, complex analysis, is extremely helpful if we are studying harmonic function, no solution of the Laplacian. So similarly, that uh, version based on double numbers is uh, very helpful uh, if we are considering wave equation so as a replacement for Laplacian. But uh, if we will uh, try to build the Cauchy integral formula based on this function, then we will see what the integral formula, in fact, reduces just to summation of two values of uh, our function on the boundary. So instead of taking entire integral with the Cauchy type kernel, we are simply taking the sum of values of intersection with uh, the, of light cone passing the given point in the domain with uh, the boundary. So light cone intersects, say, if it's upper, our uh, domain is um, upper half plane, we uh, do intersection of light cone passing a point in the upper half plane uh, with the boundary, which is real line, where are two points. So this is exactly <coughs> point x plus y, x minus y, for the point inside of the main. So that is a kind of Cauchy integral formula, which is not very inspiring in uh, that case. And reason uh, that or consequence of uh, such uh, rather simple theory is as follows. So uh, a lot of people uh, at some point come to these ideas, try to develop a theory. At the beginning, they were very enthusiastic and believe that they find something comparable to the entire field of uh, complex analysis, which is very important and have many useful applications. Uh, but very soon, uh, the theory became exhausted with double numbers, and um, it's um, in it, uh, all its development is much more uh, thin compared to the uh, real complex, uh, natural complex analysis with um, analytic functions. And then uh, that work stopped and became very quickly forgotten by other mathematicians. And then it's produced an effect what in another 10 or 15 years, another mathematician came to the same ideas and published another paper without any knowledge what that was done before. So um, the first paper which I know on that subject was published in 1935. And since then it may be 10 times other people uh, rediscover the basics of that theory independently or very, very little references to the previous work on the subject. If we will consider what will happen <coughs> with the uh, dual numbers, uh, here the situation is different. So uh, square of uh, dual imaginary unit is equal to zero, and so any higher power of that imaginary unit <coughs> also will be equal to zero. That means that uh, we are written down the binomial formula uh, which involve the, the dual imaginary unit when it contains only two terms, 
a term without imaginary unit and that imaginary unit in uh, power, uh, first power. Uh, no high, higher power appears and just two terms uh, are here. And it's easy to see <clears throat> what the second term is a derivative of the first term with respect to x times uh, epsilon y. And then, uh, using that observation, that happened for any uh, integer power k, so if we substitute that expansion into Taylor series, we will see what analytic extension uh, for dual uh, uh, numbers will be simply value of function plus epsilon y derivative of this function at point x. Uh, connection with uh, differential equation is broken at this point, so we will uh, prefer what um, uh, theory based on dual numbers will be a replacement uh, of Laplacian by the heat equation, by elliptical equation, by parabolic equation, so it will be some our expectation, but that does not happen in that straightforward approach based on Taylor series. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that formula is not completely useless, in fact, it can be considered as a very uh, straightforward uh, variant of uh, so-called non-standard analysis. So, if you are familiar with the theory or heard about it, it's um, work as follow. We introduce uh, infinitesimal numbers, which are uh, not satisfying to Archimedean axiom uh, in relation to real numbers. So, uh, any multiple of epsilon is still less than any other real number except zero. So, epsilon is really infinitesimal. And then square of epsilon will be infinitesimal of the higher order. It will be uh, negligibly small uh, on the scale of epsilon. And uh, here, in our theory, we have uh, even uh, more uh, strong assumption. Epsilon square not only negligibly small on this epsilon scale, it's even zero, so it's completely vanished. And that um, uh, produced algebraic, not analytic, even al it's algebraic version of non-standard analysis, but it's still <clears throat> useful, so it's easy to demonstrate, say, rules for different uh, derivative of the product or um, other uh, rules of calculus based that dual number. So, in sense of ped pedagogical approach, so it may be uh, having some benefits. Yet, um, uh, that naive expansion of Taylor series based on hyper-complex numbers uh, shall not tell us from our uh, quest, and we will try to develop certain hyper-complex function theory uh, from a different source. And our source will be, of course, SL2R. We will use SL2R to develop some non-trivial uh, analytical function theories. Uh, what we will mm, uh, use, in a sense, uh, uh, may be uh, named as wavelets. Uh, wavelets is very popular topic in mathematics and very helpful topic in mathematics, which come from a lot of physical, uh, many physical uh, and engineering uh, applications, uh, signal processing, quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics that um, construction is known as coherent states. Um, so, Again, uh, that is a good indication what certain mathematical theory is indeed uh, deep and important if uh, people in different areas uh, came to that uh, uh, structure independently and then uh, they give, of course, different names because they are not aware of work in other areas. Uh, so, if an object has a lot of different names, it's a typical indication what object is indeed useful and helpful. So, we will interchangeably use uh, words, wavelets, and uh, coherent states um, uh, in that uh, for that structure. Uh, although, classically, wavelets um, uh, denote something much more uh, restricted, something which is uh, uh, rather specific. 
and that uh, specific classical theory of wavelets is related to uh, action of so-called X plus B group. This is group of affine transformation of the real line, which consists of scaling. So that A here, which multiply X, produces a scaling of the real line, and B uh, produce here the shift. So composition of shift and scaling is uh, the group of uh, affine transformation for the real line. And in theory of wavelets, what we are doing <coughs> typically, we uh, apply all possible shift and uh, we apply all possible shifts and scaling to a certain uh, particular function which called mother wavelet. And results uh, which obtained by this shift and um, scalings uh, are called wavelets. So transformation of mother wavelets produce wavelets. <coughs> And then uh, we make a so-called wavelet transform where we produce an inner product of given function f, which typically in engineering application falls to be a signal, say, and uh, we I take inner product over the collection of these wavelets. So that inner product, of course, depends from the value of scale and scaling and shift which you apply. So it became a function of A and B. So uh, as a result of wavelet transformation, we obtain a function on the AX plus B group, define it by this formula. And uh, the, in a sense, that is similar to the decomposition over orthonormal basis with uh, important difference what wavelets altogether they are not linearly independent so this is over complete system it allowed to decompose arbitrary signal over that collection of uh, samples uh, but samples uh, uh, themselves are not linearly independent so we have uh, enough and even more than enough uh, samples to represent any signal and that decomposition in terms of signals, uh, sample signals, uh, is very helpful in our analyzing uh, particular uh, given signal. We can decompose it not only in terms of frequency, uh, but we are, it uh, possible to make some uh, <clears throat> analysis in terms of uh, time, location of the signal, and so on. So we will not go much into engineering application of it. We will just illustrate how things are uh, done for the case of Gaussian. Here I need to say a word of warning. Uh, Gaussian here taken to be a non-standard uh, example because for the usual theory of wavelets, there is certain um, admissibility condition which indeed uh, requires what integral of our uh, sample uh, shall be over entire real line shall be equal to zero. So um, our uh, sample signal shall behave like a sign or something like that, which have both positive and negative values, which integrated over the real line produces zero. Gaussian is not of this type, uh, so it's not admissible in terms of wavelets, but it still <coughs> may be useful if we are uh, treating it in sense of uh, quantum mechanics. So Gaussian typically uh, came as the ground state uh, quantum mechanical system of harmonic oscillator. So scaling here on the first picture we see uh, the basic Gaussian given as exponent of minus x square over 2. When scaling produce something which uh, if we scale it down produce something which tends to delta distribution so we are uh, able to represent an integral which is supported just in 1.0 in the limit. And um, if we uh, consider the second picture, that produce shifts of Gaussian uh, over the real line. That means what we are able to give that uh, limiting value of delta function, not only at point zero, but in fact in any arbitrary point of the real line, we can decompose it in similar way. Another um, uh, sample of mother wavelet, which is 
uh, of interest, although it, it is again not admissible in the sense of wavelet theory. That is a function one divided over x plus i. If you will apply uh, scaling and shift to this function on the real line, uh, the resulting uh, function, uh, which will depend from points A, B, will be exactly Cauchy kernel. Here it's uh, again maybe worth to notice what uh, geometrically uh, the group AX plus B is isomorphic, as I said, to the upper half plane. Parameter A for a scaling, which we are using, it is positive, so it's uh, vertical axis for the half plane, and parameter B is any real number, so it's a, a, along the real axis. So points of the upper half plane parameterize the elements of X plus B group. So if for such element A, B, you apply transformation of scaling and shift to the function which we have 1 divided by X plus I, we will get exactly uh, Cauchy kernel in the uh, upper half plane. Uh, so we will transform, which we indicated on this slide, uh, then uh, that we will transform will be exactly Cauchy integral formula over the real line. So that is connection of the wavelet theory with complex analysis, and it indicates what there is certain connection between structure of X plus B group and complex analysis and integral representations. We also note what X plus B group is just the subgroup of SL2R, upper triangular matrices, which we consider it at the beginning of our geometric course, upper triangular matrices make a subgroup which is isomorphic to X plus B group. So that is um, just a particular or smaller subset of the group which we are considering. Um, on the other hand, also X plus B group as an upper half plane can be uh, connected with the uh, homogeneous spaces when we studied uh, three type of homogeneous spaces under Mobius transformation, all of them was represented by upper half plane, which again can be identified with X plus B group. So here is uh, the word of general structure, uh, which is used for uh, the, in the theory of Weberle transform out of the group representation. So we set up is as follow. We have certain group G, and rho it will be its unitary irreducible representation in certain Hilbert space H. Uh, unitary irreducible representation means the following. Uh, representation, first of all, this is a map from elements of the group to the uh, certain operators on the Hilbert space. So when we multiply operators uh, which correspond to elements, say, G1 and G2, the product of these two operators shall be an uh, operator which is produced by the product of element G1, G2. So that is a group homomorphism from the group G to the group of unitary operators on the uh, Hilbert space H. Irreducibility is an uh, important condition. It means what there is no <coughs> closed invariant subspaces in H uh, under that uh, group action, uh, because um, otherwise, if we have uh, such invariant subspaces, we may just decompose our representation into components, restrict our representation to that invariant subspaces to the smallest one. And this is similar to what we did when we considered action of a group on a, a certain uh, space. And when orbits uh, the group act transitively, make a decompos a decomposition of the space into uh, disjoint union of homogeneous spaces. When we are fixing a certain element W naught, we in our Gilbert space H and call it mother wavelet, 
when uh, the Weville transform is given by the first displayed formula in this slide. So we apply all possible transformation from the group G to mother wavelet, resulting uh, transformations uh, called wavelets, and make an inner product of given function or given vector from the Hilbert space H uh, with uh, with wavelets. Uh, inner product depend from element G, so a result of this transformation will be certain function on the uh, group G. If our uh, transformation was unitary and it was continuous, uh, then we may conclude what image, the function which obtained as a result of this level of transformation, will be continuous bounded function on the group G. <coughs> we uh, mentioned what uh, among different uh, representation of a group G, there are uh, several standard one. Uh, for any group G, we can define so-called left regular representation. That uh, representation act on functions which define it on G uh, by the left shift of argument. So this is the formula for left regular representation. And um, that uh, representation is typically uh, reducible, so there are certain invariant subspaces uh, here. But um, what is important in, the, uh, in our consideration is as follow. So uh, what wavelet transformation which we defined before, it's intertwined the given representation row which we use for the wavelet transform with the left regular representation. That means if I apply to a vector uh, my representation row with certain element G and then make wavelet transform, uh, that result will be the same as if I first do the wavelet transform and then apply left shift on the group G. Uh, as a consequence of that, we may deduce that the image space of the wavelet transform is invariant space under left shift because space H is invariant under representation row by means of highlighted formula we see what the image of wavelet transform shall be invariant under left shift and also uh, we may also uh, conclude what uh, the image of wavelet transform shall be spanned by the left translations of the image of mother wavelet. So uh, we may just um, take the transformation wavelet transform of one particular function and that all left shift of this function will span the entire image space. That also follow simply from the irreducibility of representation row and the intertwining formula which we highlight on the screen. So everything depends on that intertwining formula uh, and intertwining formula itself is very easy uh, to demonstrate. It's essentially follow from the definition of wavelet transform. So by that formula uh, wavelet transform of the uh, row applied to V <coughs> just as we defined given by such in a product when since we have here the representation row which is a group homomorphism row H inverse row G can be treated as row from G inverse H inverse and that it became just a formula for wavelet transform with the parameter G inverse H and that is simply the left shift of the wavelet transform. So three lines of a simple algebraic calculation shows that general result, which is rather important in construction of entire theory. So all other parts of uh, the uh, proposition follow 
from that formula. So here is a brief indication which we discussed before. Now, uh, uh, we already mentioned what X plus B group uh, is subgroup of SL2R. And the question is, what will happen if we will consider the larger group? Uh, from the point of view of decomposition, that may look a bit unnecessary because uh, the uh, collection of wavelets which uh, generated by AX plus B group is already complete. We can decompose arbitrary signal over that uh, samples, which are wavelets, uh, if they are generated from AX plus B group. You don't need, uh, on the first glance, you don't need any more samples to make such a decomposition uh, for signal. But yet, it is convenient to have a larger group because it allows to make a finer resolution to take a look on closely on certain uh, properties of your signal. And here is really uh, another main ideology of the wavelet transform coming from because wavelets form over complete system, uh, so they are uh, contain much more vectors, which is just necessary for simple decomposition of the signal. But that variety of additional samples allow to have a finer analysis. So similarly here, if we expand group from AX plus B to SL to R, we even have a more finer resolution. <clears throat> and here is an example coming back to the uh, our Gaussian. We already told what we may scale and shift Gaussian to obtain various wavelets. We uh, can expand our group uh, to SL2R. Uh, for a fine group, it's enough to add inversion. When inversion together with the action of uh, AX plus B group generate entire SL2R. So uh, let's look what how Gaussian is transformed under the uh, inversion-like uh, uh, transformation, uh, it's shown on that slide. And then uh, you see what out of Gaussian, we obtain uh, additional uh, distribution. So if uh, scaling of Gaussian produce a delta function at the limit, here we are able to obtain even derivative of delta function as the limiting distribution uh, uh, which may be applied to our analysis. So here is an expansion. Uh, we may be encouraged by that thing and try to apply the larger group SL to R to the function we generate Cauchy kernel uh, here um, and see what SL to R is it produce some refinement of complex analysis for us. But uh, here came somehow a disappointment because um, uh, application of SL2R to, to that function produce only Cauchy kernel again. So no additional um, wavelets come from the larger group. Uh, and we will later discuss why it's happened. There is some special uh, properties of uh, Cauchy kernel which uh, characterize it uh, in exactly in this sense and uh, telling why it's uh, exactly related to the uh, standard theory of analytical functions. <clears throat> uh, before we will be able uh, to build a theory uh, of um, wavelets based on SL to R, we will need a good collection of representation because different analytical function theory came from the different linear representations of the uh, given group. And here is a, a brief summary of the certain construction which is known as induced representation. And that induced representation uh, construction is really uh, allow us make an expansion of uh, representation, define it on certain subgroup to entire group. 
So setup is as follow. We let G be a group, H be its closed subgroup, and let H has a representation, a linear representation, in a certain Hilbert space uh, H. Uh, as V, sorry, H here subgroup. So we have a, a representation in a space V. When for the set of V-valued function, we, uh, or, or can we considering V-valued function on the group G, we may uh, pick up subspace having a property uh, indicated in that displayed formula. So if we shift that function from the right by elements of subgroup H, uh, then uh, that reduced only to the multiplication of value of function by uh, or action uh, of representation uh, chi to the, uh, on the range of our function. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, as you see, shift in the domain from the right by element of H produce a certain action only on the range. Uh, so reduce it to the action on the range. And that will be uh, related, that in very induced representation construction will be related to the geometry which we considered in the first part of the course. It is obvious what the such uh, action uh, or such space of function with highlighted property is invariant under left shift. Indeed, a left and right shift on the group always commute, even if our group is not commutative, left and right shift commutes. So if I apply to function F capital a left shift, I will again obtain a function exactly with the same property. So that subspace of function with this property is invariant on the left shift. And if it's invariant on the left shifts, we may consider a restriction of uh, left regular representation, which is done by left shift, to that invariant subspace. So we consider the restriction, and that restriction is called induced representation. Here, a sub representation, uh, representation H of subgroup, uh, representation chi of subgroup H is a key building element for our construction. <coughs> Uh, there is a second form of this induced representation, uh, which is based on homogeneous spaces uh, construction. So uh, let us consider the homogeneous space X, which is G uh, over H. So this is a type of homogeneous spaces we considered in the first part of the course. Then we may build for every function defined on this homogeneous space, uh, a function defined on entire group. As you remember, uh, for in the first part of the course, we considered it as a natural projection from the group G to homogeneous space X, and we considered it a certain map S, which uh, is a section uh, assigning for every coset G over H an element of the group G which represent this coset. So in terms of this uh, maps uh, natural projection P and continuous section S, we may define function F capital as follow. So we project G uh, to the process when function F is here uh, defined on PG uh, as its function on the homogeneous space. And we act on the uh, that function by the representation chi of H, where H is this reminder. So if you remember at the end of previous lecture, I told what when we are considering the homogeneous spaces G over H, elements of H uh, became unimportant, they disappeared uh, from our construction, vanishing, and here they are uh, uh, restated back now uh, not as elements in the domain but as elements in the range as action on the range of function so that is 
uh, we will build a function as highlighted now on the screen. When it will be a function, it's easy to verify, but it will be a function exactly with the property which is the first displayed formula on the slide now. So function built according to the highlighted formula produce function with the property on the first displayed formula. So that is just another <coughs> isomorphic uh, representation of our space uh, uh, of functions with this property on the group. And when left shift uh, on that uh, space on the group lead to certain expression how our <coughs> representation act on homogeneous spaces. So uh, action of rho on the uh, group uh, of G on the function F is reduced to action on the uh, domain by means of action on the homogeneous space and remaining part H act on the range. <coughs> So that is a general uh, construction. It's very important in representation theory of the groups, uh, Lie groups and uh, finite groups where are um, a huge uh, uh, amount of literature on induced representation construction. Uh, so, but we will here will be interested just in induced representation in, of SL2R and we will make induction uh, from one dimensional subgroup. And as we again remember from the first part of the course, uh, within SL2R, there are just three different types of one dimensional continuous subgroup. They are conjugated either to A, N, or K. So we may try to make induction from this one dimensional subgroup A and K <coughs> for SL2R. But um, to make induction, uh, for the subgroup, uh, we uh, need uh, first consider a representation of this one parameter subgroup. And the representation of this one parameter subgroup, uh, because if it's one uh, dimensional subgroup and we want to have an irreducible representation, that, that representation shall be one dimensional, it shall be a character. So it shall act in one dimensional vector space. And let's first consider the subgroup K, compact subgroup, and what are characters of subgroup K, which is isomorphic to the uh, rotation of the unit circle. That uh, one-dimensional character are indeed uh, acting by uh, that geometrical uh, way, so it's uh, isometric rotation of two-dimensional space. So that is uh, representation uh, which reduced to multiplication for element of subgroup K. The uh, representation is simply multiplication by this character. And here we again come to the uh, expression of exponent in term of cosine and sine function and we have here natural <coughs> uh, expansion uh, uh, which is known as earlier formula this one uh, of the exponent in term of trigonometric function and rotation of the two-dimensional plane, as, uh, which uh, represented by multiplication with this unimodular complex number, preserve the modulus of a complex numbers or Euclidean distance. So what we have, this is an invariant under such a transformation. <clears throat> what happens if we will try to consider the characters of the uh, subgroup A diagonal matrices? Uh, that subgroup A, um, characters of that subgroup A correspond to the geometry of double numbers with square of imaginary unit equal to 1. And if I will use the Taylor expansion of the exponent, as we did before, uh, Taylor expansion of the exponent and properties of what j squared is equal to 1 will lead to a certain formula which is related to the earlier formula, but this time we have hyperbolic cosine and sine function. So this will be the 
transformation which uh, serve as a character for subgroup A. And that multiplication by such double numbers is a rotation in the Minkowski space-time and it's preserve uh, Lorentz distance, so uh, relativistic, special relativity distance which is given in this uh, model case as U squared minus V squared. So this is a hyperbolic distance preserved by that multiplication. <clears throat> Again, coming back to the dual numbers, uh, with a square of epsilon equal to zero and higher, any higher order of epsilon, uh, uh, power of epsilon, epsilon will be equal to zero as well. So Taylor expansion of exponent will reduce simply to the two terms, one plus epsilon t, which is a linear function in t. And uh, if we will multiply double numbers by such uh, uh, double numbers uh, which correspond exponent, then the quantity which will be preserved, like a distance, we already discussed it in corresponding part of the geometry course, that parabolic distance look rather degenerate, it depends only from first component U, U squared, no uh, uh, part corresponding to V squared. So this is uh, three characters which we have for our subgroup K, A and N here in uh, construction of one-dimensional representation for uh, subgroups. And here is the picture which illustrate that uh, transformation. So uh, we have left one is Euclidean rotations, orbit R circles, and when uh, they correspond to the point with the same distance from the origin, uh, if we look on the right picture, we have hyperbolic rotations. Here, orbits are hyperbolas. Again, they correspond to the points with the same Lorentz distance from the origin. And uh, parabolic rotations look very degenerate. So multiplication by that parabolic number have orbits which are vertical lines. So uh, rather looking rather degenerate. Uh, and probably not very helpful for, uh, not entirely helpful for our consideration. So what can be done uh, for building more interesting parabolic characters, we will discuss on a lecture next week. Are there any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Don't forget to mark your attendance.